Hi class, welcome back. Um, so this week we are going to study uh, economic systems. Um, so we're going to talk about, you know, the United States economic system, which is, you know, it's a mixed economy, but it's based off like a market system. So we'll talk about that. And um, I know a lot of you guys are really fascinated by the whole socialism, communism thing. So we'll touch on that today, too. So hopefully this will be an interesting lesson for you guys. Um, so let's get started. Uh, economic systems, this topic, um, vary around the world. Uh, some like the one that we have here in the United States are based on the markets, like I talked about, right? Um, and then there's others like China, uh, which I'll talk about quite a bit today because China has such a large economy. They're a really good example of stuff. Um, China's uh, feature far greater government control than we do, right? So although they do have some market economy qualities, they are very much more a communist nation, right? So these different economies deal with uh, scarcity in different ways. That's all this has to do with. Because remember, when we talk about the economy, the whole question is, you know, what do we produce? How do we produce it? And to whom we produce, right? That's all of our questions. And economic systems is just different countries' ways of answering that question. Um, and that's how they determine what their economic system is. <clears throat> so, of course, I've got to give you a video. Um, for economic systems as a crash course. It just goes through the different economic systems. It's a really good video. So we'll start with traditional. We won't talk about this very much, um, but this is kind of like the OG uh, economic system, right? Um, it's based on custom. It's 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 uh, usually in what I in my day, we called them third world countries, but now they're called like developing countries. Um, a lot of barter, right? Like, you know, your expertise is um, sewing, weaving baskets. You've been doing it for generations and you trade your baskets for the other things you need, the food, the clothing, the whatever it is, right? It's the barter system. Um, how do they answer economic questions? The way they always have. They've been doing this for hundreds and hundreds of years and this is just the way it is. Um, so this is definitely more a popular option in a lot of the more rural developing nations around the world. They would have people who have a traditional economy are going to have a small GDP. They're going to have a small um a GDP is like an indicator of how, how wealthy your nation is, right? I'm not going to have a lot of wealth if you use this type of economic system. So um, this is, of course, not what we use, of course. So let's actually start with the command economy, which is also not what we do. So <clears throat> the command economy is the opposite of a market economy, and we'll talk about a market economy in a minute. But uh, a pure command economic system, the individual, us, like the, the regular citizen, um, has very little, if none at all, influence on how the economy functions, which is why it's the opposite of a market system. Um, so major economic decisions are made by the central government. The government tells producers what to do. It commands it, right? It commands them what to do, which is why it's called a command economy. Look what they did there. Um, it's also called a controlled economy. So that's part of what that means. So how do we answer economic questions? We don't. The government does. <laughs> That's how the economic questions in a command economy are actually answered. So a lot of you guys ask, like, okay, so people equate socialism and communism. So, like, what is the big difference? So socialism started in, like, the early 1800s or so, um, and it came off of the idea that that people believed that, that workers were being um, oppressed in the capitalist society, right? So they, they, socialists advocated that the workers weren't getting near enough of the profit or of the um, benefit of producing something than like, say, like the owners, right? The big dogs. So the problem, the socialism idea is that that whole, the top part of the, of the population in terms of, of, of wealth are making way more than the rest of the people. That's kind of where it comes from. So in the early 1800s, they, Socialism was advocated, and the belief was that uh, the means of production should be owned and controlled by society, either directly or through government. So socialists felt that the system would distribute wealth more equally among systems if, if uh, capitalism was eliminated, if we didn't have this free market option. Communism uh, was developed by this guy, Karl Marx, who you probably have heard of by now. Um, German, very German. That's why his name Karl starts with a K and Marx ends with an X. Very German name. <clears throat> he was a socialist and he um, 
he predicted the, a violent revolution basically, right? So like he believed that the population in industrialized nations is divided into like capitalists who are actually making all this money and then everyone else, which is like the majority of the people. So like Marx interpreted human history as a class struggle between the working people. So like what you would see is the middle class workers and the big dogs, right? Um, so eventually he thought the workers would have revolt because they first of all outnumbered the what he called the bourgeoisie, the fancy people. He out they, the workers outnumbered them, and they would he he pretty much decided they wouldn't be able to put up with with being exploited this way. So he believed that like socialism, because remember he was a socialist, would develop into communism. So like under communism, one class would evolve, all property would be held in common, everyone would be equal, et cetera, et cetera. So like that was his ideal thing because he just was looking for like equality. So um this is important because in, so let's go back one slide. So we're back to the command economy slide real quick. In a command economy, most productive resources, especially land and capital, are owned by the government, not by private individuals. So the government makes the three basic allocation decisions, the what to sell, the how to sell, to whom to sell, because they are the ones who literally own all of the methods of production. Um, they are the ones who regulate it. They're the ones who who manage the raw materials. They're the ones who decide what's going to be made and how much of it and what type of it and who's going to make it, all of that. All of that is decided by the government. It also means that they can fix wages. There's no competition. There's not. It's not like there's five different companies making the same thing and you can go see, oh, well, these ones pay more. They have better benefits or whatever it is, right? No, you have a set amount that you're making. Everyone's the same. So like what ends up happening is like unsurprisingly a lot of governments and command economies, um, they have their planning agencies, those people who are in power, the government has a, has a lot of power, of course, right? You give people the option to have a lot of power, they're gonna take it. Um, and these organizations make the important decisions for how different parts of the economy, like agriculture, product, uh, steel production, everything, consumer product manufacturing, literally everything, they decide how it works. Um, and because of that inefficiency of not having competition, which is actually a really, really good thing. We like competition. It makes it so that we have better products. Um, we have more efficient ways of making products, whatever it may be, cheaper ways of making products. Because they don't have that competition part of the economy, their growth is generally slower. So command economies tend to grow more slowly um, than market economies do. So like if we look at like the drastic examples of a command economy like North Korea or what Cuba used to be, if you look at their GDP, it's bad. they don't have a great economy. And you can also blame the fact that pe their people don't trade with them, which is why their economy is bad. But they wouldn't have a good economy anyways because they have this command economy. Um, so that's kind of why communism, first of all, doesn't really happen in, in its entirety. There's no co country that's 100% communist except maybe North Korea is the closest, closest you can get. Um, and even that is not 100% communist. Um, it, the big difference is like, you know, communism is socialism under a communist dictatorship. So like if you're in China, you and you're an elected official, you are part of the communist party. You have to be, which is bizarre, right? Like it would be like saying in the United States, you have to be a member of the Republican Party to be elected. Like that doesn't make any sense. What's the point of even voting? Um, but that's what communism pretty much is. Um, and that's the big difference. So socialism is just this idea that the workers uh, should have more say in the means of production. It's more about anti like big dogs anti like the the super duper rich communism is more like giving government every bit of control so that everything's completely equal but then you know it kind of devolves from there honestly so this video does a good job of explaining communism versus socialism so if you want to hear someone else who's not me explain that that's a good call so now let's do some market so market is our economy, basically, right? Um, in a market economy, private citizens, so not to the government, own the factors of production. So uh, those factors of production, right, are natural resources, capital, labor, entrepreneurship. So all of those things are, are owned or um, assigned by us, the uh, private citizens of the country. So how are questions answered? How are those economic questions? How is the who, what, where, why? How are all those questions answered? It's answered by us, the consumers. Um, we answer what by buying things, and if we like it and we need more or we're, we're, we are willing to pay more, then we will have more produced. 
We also, if we don't buy something, then that product is probably not going to be produced. In a command economy, right, it doesn't matter who buys what because it's not all the products aren't owned by individual people. The government's charged everything, so they don't have that, like, that system where they know what people want just based off what they buy, um, which is why we're able to grow so much faster because we have so much more information on what our people need and want and are willing to, like, put money toward. I like market economies make a lot more sense to me. So let's go through a couple of characteristics of a market economy. This list here is more in depth than I'm even going to go into, but this is just a lot of the different um, terms that you're likely to hear when you, it comes to a market, a free market or free enterprise system, same kind of thing. Um, so the first is individual freedom. Let's start with individual. So like little to no government intervention, right? So a market economy offers a high degree of individual freedom because businesses, which are owned by the people, right? We decide what, how, and for whom to produce. So driving those decisions is the business owner's desire to earn a profit, right? They need to make money. They're not going to make something people don't want. They're not going to make a product that's bad or poorly made because they know people aren't going to want that. Um, at the same time, the consumers, us, we decide what to buy. So in a market economy, supply and demand interact to set the prices um, to, and the producers and consumers make those decisions after that. So decisions in a market economy are made by all the people in the economy, not just by a few, right? All of us by deciding what we need, what we want, and what we're buying. That is us indicating what we actually want. Um, so we call market economy decentralized right little to no government intervention whenever something's centralized whenever you hear something being described as centralized in the economy or in politics usually they're talking about just like gov their government's role and how strong it is so if something's not centralized then there's not as or decentralized there's not as much government control um generally like if in a completely free market economy the government would run with no interference from the government but like that's impossible no one has that <clears throat> pure market economies don't exist seldom exist, I guess. Um, even the United States, for example, the government provides public goods like national defense, right? Or um, fire and police department, your school, right? Like I am paid for by the government. I exist because of government intervention. Thank goodness that's true though, right? Because if it was a free market education system, then not everyone would be able to afford a basic education. There's, there's things that we wanted to make sure that the government provided for the people without the market system being involved. Um, and that's and that's good. There's no completely free market option. There's a little bit of socialism in everything that we do. Um, but that but it's 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 for the better. But mostly we are a very free market society. I'll talk about competition down here. So competition um, is another way that governments can play a role in the economy. They make sure the markets stay competitive, right? So they make sure that there's no um, one company that monopolizes and takes over everything and bumps out all of the smaller competition. So like as a consumer in the market economy, you and I are likely to benefit from the competition between sellers. If there's no competition, then that one person who's making that one product could charge however much they want. So we want competition because it keeps prices low, but it also keeps products great because if there's only one person making one product, then they don't have to make it super great because everyone's going to buy it regardless because they don't have another option. So by having competition, people are pushed, um, businesses and entrepreneurs and inventors are pushed to, to innovate and to make things better and, and improve it because they want people to actually purchase their products. So competition is a huge deal in a free market enterprise. It's why there is slow growth in communist uh, markets because, and command economies, right? Or communist societies, command societies, because there is that competition link missing, that it does not exist. So they don't have that innovation as, as much as, um, as we do here. Competition is a really, really big deal. Um, governments also influence externalities. So here's another way that our government involves itself, right? So like uh, think of uh, pollution. That's a good one. So for uh, an example, the government works to reduce pollution because pollution is what we call a negative externality. It also encourages activities that generate, you know, positive externalities. Like um, the government will provide money to fund scientific research which is a really like, think about all of the companies who dropped what they were doing to start coronavirus research, right? To try and find a vaccine. They didn't just do that for free. The government gave them money to start doing that as an incentive. Like, hey, we really need this. Here's this money. 
go stop whatever you're doing and start doing this. And that's an incentive to do it, right? This is a, it's a business is businesses. They're asking to make this, so they need incentive to do it. So that's a way that the government stepped in to try and like get a positive externality or they'll step in and put limitations on pollution, right? Because that, that hurts everyone if, if the land and air is polluted. Um, so that's another way that like the government sometimes gets involved in a free market. So now we're going to talk about a mixed economy. Um, the only reason I even really want you to know what a command economy is compared to a market economy is because they're drastically different, but in reality, they don't actually exist in real life. Um, there's no 100% command economy and there's no 100% free market economy. There's no government, there's no country that exists where the government is not involved at all in the economy. And that's a good thing that would probably go poorly. And there's no, there's no government that is in charge of the entirety of the economic system in any country, right? Another good thing. Um, so we have what is called a mixed economy, which means exactly what you think. Some individual freedom, some government control. So then it's just deter it's just determining how much individual freedom and how much government control a specific country has. So like if you're going to compare United States and China, you know, spoiler alert, China has way more government control, but they are both technically mixed economies, right? So pure forms of command economy, market economy don't exist. So in most cases, a country's economic system combines economic theories, which makes it a mixed economy. Individuals carry on their economic affairs freely, but are subject to the government intervention, like we just talked about, right, where the government can intervene and say, hey, make this um, coronavirus vaccine, or hey, you shouldn't be polluting, like you are going to be punished if you keep polluting that poorly, etc. Um, so many countries have a mixed economy. United States, free enterprise is combined with supported uh, and supported by the government um, in the marketplace. So the government keeps competition free, keeps competition fair, stops like monopolies, um, make sure that the, the public interest is set. Um, and we, but we also provide uh, services to businesses. So like the federal and state governments build highways, right? We have extensive highway systems. Those were not part of the free market system. Um, thank goodness. What if you had to all build your own roads to get places? Like that's horrible. Like if you built a house um, and your little community and there was no one to come and like build roads to get you from one place to another, that would be really unfortunate. So that's another thing that the government does um, to help competition and markets and um, help us grow. We can't grow without roads. We need roads. So um, that's something that they help promote. How, they, how a government in a mixed economy would help promote the economy. So many government agencies produce and distribute goods and services to consumers giving governments a direct role in the economy. The role is direct because the government supplies the goods and services that compete with private business. The best answer for this one, like what I'm talking about right now is the US Postal Service. The US Postal Service is technically a government agency and they do technically work for profit. Um, and they are technically competition against UPS and FedEx, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we have the United States Postal Service and the best example is why is, is the election we just had, right? Because we have the United States Postal Service run by our government, we were able to have options for people to vote at home. No one had to pay for stamps to send back their ballots, right? It was a what they call like a prepaid envelope because the, United, the U.S. Postal Service is worked for and operated by the government. So because of that, they were able to say, hey, we're going to send out all of these ballots to all these millions and millions of people. Um, and they're all going to be able to come back for free. And they were able to do that because it's their own company and they can do that. That's like another way that, that the government is involved in some of the stuff we do. Um, the government also plays an indirect role uh, when it acts as an umpire, I suppose you could say, to make the economy operate smoothly. So um, and an, uh, and an example of this would be regulation of like public utilities, um, water and electric services. So um, basically what if you think about it in your home, you have running water and electricity, most likely. Um, and what if the company who is providing those things for you decided to just make everything three times more expensive, right? It's not like, it's not like electricity and water are a luxury item, right? Those, those are necessary for like life, especially in the winter. Uh, you need heat, you need water, you need all of it. So those are things that the government makes sure that, um, they will not, competition will not rise prices or, or, 
the, the, the company itself will rise prices. A lot of times what happens is there'll be one country, company in like the entire state, like in North Carolina, who runs all the electricity and all of the water. And they're allowed to do that because the government says, hey, you're allowed to do that. You're just not allowed to make it this much more expensive. Like you can't charge out the wazoo for people's water and electricity. And we're letting you be in charge of all of it if you want to, but you can't do that. And that's just because like they wouldn't do that for everything, right? It's just because it's something like electricity and water, things that are basic human needs that it would be wrong if those prices raised astronomically. So like that's another way that the government makes sure that things aren't going out of control. This is why a free market economy can't exist just as a whole, right? Because it's there's just too many things that could go wrong um, when we talk about it. So this is just the last side. It's what I've been saying the whole time. All economies are mixed. What determines whether an economy is considered market or command depends on the level of government involvement. Um, so if you have a friend who says they're socialist, they are not they are not saying that they are for the government being in charge of everything, right? You, you're learning this today. Um, if you have someone who says they hate socialism, it mean, doesn't necessarily mean that they're only free market, right? It means that everyone's kind of in the middle. Um, and that's a good thing. We like, it's called compromise, people. I know you don't see it anymore in politics, but it exists. I promise. Um, all right. Well, those are pretty short notes all in all. And that's it. So if you guys have any questions, let me know. Okay.